All right, this morning we're going to wrap up our series in Malachi called Worshiping the God Who Is, and we are looking at last words, specifically God's last words for over 400 years from the close of the Old Testament until the coming of Jesus. So last words are powerful. Last words are something that, that can be used to shape us and that stick with us and that give us perspective, especially when they come from somebody that we love. So if you've been around the church for a while, you probably know a little bit of my story, maybe a lot of my story. But for me, a lot of my story hinges on an evening, October 7th of 1993. And fortunately, we have a few less college students this morning, less people to tell me I wasn't even born then. But I'm wondering, do we have a few that weren't, weren't even born October 7th of 93? Got any of those? Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Good. Good. Okay, we have somebody delusional. If we could bring the ushers through. Shouldn't say that. Strike that from the record. All right. October 7th, 93. It wasn't my dad's last words, but it was the night that I found out that my dad's last words were coming. It was two days away from my 17th birthday, and I was really at a crossroads. Basically, I was living this life where I believed in Jesus, but I was definitely not all in. I love Jesus. I worship Jesus. In, in many ways, I was a good Sunday school boy. If you ask my Sunday school teachers, they would tell you, Shannon's the best. Shannon goes through the motion. He reads his Bible. He prays. He's, he's nice to the old ladies. He does all the things that a good little Christian Boy Scout is supposed to do. But at a heart level, I was really torn. I was a worshiper of Jesus, and yet I was a worshiper of a lot of other things. You know, I love Jesus, and I pursue Jesus, but but my heart was chasing after a lot of other things, everything that a teenage boy's heart would typically chase after. So my heart was really torn, but I didn't, the tension didn't bother me at all. So that night, I'm driving to the hospital. It's my dad. He's supposed to have this routine surgery. No big deal. I've, just not going to be a big thing. But I go after school, look and see him post-surgery, hang out a little bit, and the surgery isn't over. And over the next four hours, people keep on flooding in until it's not just my mom and my sister and I, but it's our extended family, and it's our friends, and it's like 30-plus people that are all shoved into an alcove of the lobby, and we're just waiting. And then finally, the doctor comes out, and he says the word. He says cancer. And, and that the cancer, it started, started in his colon, and it spread to his liver. It was on both lobes of the liver. The cancer is not going anywhere. It, it spread too far. And, you know, in the coming days, we find out one to two years, you know, that's probably what he's got. So that hits me. And I remember what I did that night. A lot of you guys, if you've been around, like I said, you've heard this story. But I went home, and I got down on my knees, and then I decided knees aren't going to cut it, so I got down on my face. I laid down on the floor. I put my face to the ground, my ear to the ground, and I just prayed. I said, God, you say that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. That's who I want to be. I don't want to play games anymore. I want to seek you. I want to follow after you. I want to turn from everything else and run hard after you. Please save my dad. All right? So for me, that was a moment of repentance. It was a moment of turning. It was a moment of finally surrendering wholeheartedly to my God. That's the sort of moment that we've been seeing the Israelite nation move forward toward throughout the book of Malachi. So we've been getting all of these people who... They're grumbling and complaining, and they're not really satisfied with who God is and how he's interacting with them. And, the, okay, God, you're over here, but, but God, we really want your stuff. Or, God, we want you to provide in this way, or we want you to answer this prayer. We want you to do this thing. We're really kind of disgruntled with you. So we're seeing this entire nation that's disgruntled. And the book of Malachi, it's been this argument back and forth between God and his people. But over the last couple of weeks, as we've gotten to the end of the argument, we've seen a remnant of those people say, you know what, this is crazy. We love our God. We no longer want to run away from our God. Okay, so these, these people, they were looking at their lives and they say, I feel distant from God, which they were. I feel alienated and ashamed, and rightly so. But they come to this moment where God says to them, return to me, and I will return to you. Come back to me, and I will come back to you. Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. It's this open invitation to turn from sin and to come back to God. And last week we saw people who were embracing that invitation, who were answering it. Malachi 3.16 says, Then those who feared the Lord talked to each other. And the Lord listened and heard. And a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. 
scroll of remembrance was bit, written by and concerning those who turn in repentance and place their faith in God. Those who answered the call when he said, return to me and I will return to you, they said, all right, we want to return. So we see this, this covenant vow renewal ceremony that's going on. And this is the thing throughout the Old Testament that God has been driving the nation toward. Early on, the first couple of books of the Bible, God makes a covenant with the nation of Israel. And then for a thousand years, we see them shredding that covenant. In all of their actions, we see them spitting on the covenant. And we see God calling them, return to the covenant, return to your vows, return to me and I will return to you. And finally, we're getting to the very last book in the Old Testament. We're getting to the very last few verses, the last seven, eight, ten verses of the Old Testament. We finally see the nation of Israel, at least a remnant of them, answering the call of God and returning to him. So the Old Testament is about to close, and it looks like, at least for some, there is going to be a happy ending. But the story wasn't really ending, because the entire Old Testament is simply a prequel. All right, It's like The Hobbit. The only reason that The Hobbit exists is to lay the foundation and to lay the backdrop for The Lord of the Rings. And some of you, you know, you've seen both Hobbit movies, you're excited about the third coming out, you love The Hobbit, but, but here's what The Hobbit's there for. It's just there as a prequel to set the stage for what's going to come after it, for The Lord of the Rings. The Old Testament, there, it's just there as a prequel to point to the real story, which is the coming of Jesus. So we get to the end of the story, we get to the end of the Old Testament, and like any good prequel, we need to hear the last words, because the last words, they are going to be the cliffhanger, they are going to be the teaser. They're going to be the closing remarks that are going to point to the real story. And likewise, within the story, they're the closing remarks that are supposed to galvanize the characters in the story, in this case, the nation of Israel, to live in light of what is coming to live with perspective, and to pursue the story that is yet to come. All right, but this isn't just good storytelling. This is real life, and these are real people. And this, this thing about last words and how they impact their, our lives, that's something that's real in the real world as well. All right? If you have last words that are spoken to you by someone that you love, they are hugely impactful. Uh, some of you, maybe you haven't lost very many people close to you. I don't know how many in the room have lost a mother, have lost a father, have lost even a grandparent. If you've lost somebody close to you, maybe a friend, have you been there in those closing moments to hear their last words? Have you been there to, to hear the last thing that they say before they enter into eternity? Last words are incredibly powerful. I already told you about the day when I found out that my dad's last words were coming. They told him, hey, you got one to two years. He ended up having about four and a half years, almost five years. But we got towards the end of that period, and I remember as a 21-year-old college student when I heard my dad's last words. And just like God, in, in what we're looking at in Malachi, these are not his last words forever. Okay, these are the last words that he's going to lay out for about 400 years of silence before the coming of Jesus. But they are his last words for a very, very long time. And when I sat there and I held my dad's hand, I was not waiting to hear his last words. Because I believe that a day of resurrection is coming when I am going to stand face to face with my dad and I will hear his words to me again. Okay? When, when we won't just be disembodied spirits, but we will be men with restored bodies, new heaven, new earth, face to face, shoulder to shoulder, having conversations being in community, living life together. So these were not my dad's absolute last words, but they were his last words for a very, very long time until the moment comes when I stand face to face with him in the resurrection. And in these words, he was lying in his bed. He was weak, he was frail. The cancer had ravaged his body. The chemo, the radiation, all of that had ravaged his body. So he's laying there, he's weak, he is frail. His liver was shutting down, so the yellow of the jaundice, it was spreading throughout his body and I'm just sitting there holding his hand. It's the morning, I don't know, like a, I think a Monday morning, Tuesday morning, something like that, about 30 hours before he finally died. But he looks over at me, and he says, how's it look? And it looked bad. 
You know, so what do you say when, when the person that you love turns to you and they are dying and they ask you, how does it look? So I just told him, it looks like you're going to be face to face with God very soon. And I asked him, how do you feel about that? And he was weak, he was frail. Um, he didn't have to think about his words, I don't think, but it took him a minute to get them out. And they were kind of staggered coming out. But what he told me is, all I care is that we do God's will. And he meant it. And I know that he meant it because he lived it. That, that was the mantra that we had lived for the preceding years of his life as we anticipated this day when his death was going to come. But those last words, they galvanized me. They gave me perspective. They did what last words are supposed to do. They pointed me towards something that was more significant, towards something that was eternal, towards something that I wanted to give my life to. That's what these last words are supposed to do for us. God is writing out his last words as he closes the Old Testament, as he closes the first book in his two-book story. And it's going to be over 400 years before he says anything else to anyone, before he authoritatively reveals himself in the person and works of Jesus Christ. These last words, again, they should give us perspective. They should galvanize us and give us resolve as we move forward in pursuit of him. So let's take a look at his last words. Malachi 3.16. We'll hit a couple of verses that we did last week, and we'll continue on into chapter 4. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other. And the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty. In that day when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them. Just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked between those who serve God and those who do not. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go out and leap like calves are released from the stall. Then you will trample down the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I do these things, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. So this morning we're looking at God's last words for a long, long time. Big picture, we're talking about heaven and hell, and how they should give us perspective and remind us to be faithful as we live in light of the restoration that is to come. Last week we wrapped up with a promise of comfort with a picture of the gospel for those who return to God. Verse 17. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty, in the day when I make up my treasured possession. If you're not sure what that treasured possession is, it's us. Not everybody in the room, but those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, those who have surrendered to Jesus and have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit are a part of what God calls the church. The people that he's chosen out of all the people of the world to be his treasured possession through faith in Jesus Christ. And he says about us, I will spare them. Just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Between those who serve God and those who do not. So God made us his. And he promised that he would spare us as a father spares his son. But there's some irony here. Because in order to spare us, God chose not to spare his actual son. That was the exchange that he made. Instead, he offered up Jesus as what theologians call a substitutionary atonement. Atonement means payment. You and I owed a debt of sin for our sin against God. The, the wages of sin is death. 
Atonement needed to be made. Payment needed to be made. A sacrifice needed to be made. This was a substitutionary atonement. So you're in a basketball game, you're in a football game, whatever. You're getting a little bit winded. You don't have the strength to do what needs to be done on the court, so the coach sends in a sub to take your place. Substitutionary atonement. God the Father sent Jesus in as a sub to say, you know what you need to do? You need to pay the penalty of God's wrath for your sin. I don't think you've got enough gas in the tank to do that, so I am subbing someone in. I am subbing Jesus in as the one who would die to satisfy the demands of justice. Because you and I are not righteous, all right? We sin, we mess up in so many ways. We fall short of the glory of God. I'm not righteous, not in myself, not on my own. But here's how Paul explains it in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, God made him who knew no sin, meaning Jesus, to be sin for us. To kind of expand that out to make it a little bit more clear. God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, to be a sin offering for us, to be our substitutionary atonement, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So God spares me as though I was his son. God spares me as though I myself were righteous because in his love for me he chose not to spare his son who was actually righteous. That's the gospel. That's, that's God's justice and God's mercy meeting in one place. The justice that he was supposed to lay out on my back being laid out on the back of Jesus Christ so that he could show mercy to me. But he says, we're not only spared from the wrath of God, we're also called to be distinct. He says he's going to make a distinction between the righteous and the wicked. He says, I'm going to spare you, but when I do, you're going to again see a distinction, a separation, a sorting out between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who don't. But if you spend any time at all around Christians, if you spend any time at all around non-Christians, then you probably know that there is not always a distinction. That sometimes there's a real big distinction in the way they act, and sometimes there's no distinction at all. How many of you know Christians who behave very, very badly? How many of you know Christians who are wretched people to live with? Now, now, in their heart, they genuinely love Jesus, or they're trying to love Jesus, or they want to love Jesus, or they're turning from their sin, but in their practice, they're just mean, or nasty, or rude, or crude, or whatever. How many of you have been that person? How many of you are that person on a daily basis? We've got two in the whole room. It's amazing. I'll, I'll be third. All right? The reality is, I don't live righteously. Now, I'm trying to. I'm seeking to. I love God. I want to pursue God, but I also have this sin nature. All right? So, you know, get me on a Sunday afternoon. I'm a little bit spent. I just want to lay on the sofa, and the kids come to me, and they're being loud. They're doing whatever. There's a decent chance that I'm going to be grumpy. Not because it's the righteous thing to do or the godly thing to do, but because I am not righteous and godly in the way that I ought to be. But God says, I'm going to make a distinction between the righteous and the unrighteous. How does he do that if none of us are righteous? if my life doesn't look all that different from the non-Christian life? How does God want to sort that out? How do we want to sort that out? We tend to want to sort it out by pretending. You know, I look at my life and, okay, it's better than it used to be. I'm not quite as proud as I used to be. I'm not quite as lustful as I used to be. Maybe it's just because I'm getting old. I don't know. But I'm, you know, my, my character is coming along at a snail's pace but that doesn't seem like enough for me. It doesn't seem like enough for God. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to come to church and I'm going to pretend that I'm further along than I am. Because God has called me to be righteous. He says there's going to be a distinction between the righteous and the wicked. I know I want to be on the winning team. And I want you to think that I'm on the winning team. So I'm going to go through the motions. I'm going to pretend. But what we're seeing in here is that God didn't die so that you could pretend. Jesus didn't die so that you could pretend. He died so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's what Martin Luther called an alien righteousness, a righteousness that's by faith, a righteousness that is from outside of me, that invades me and transforms me from the inside out and begins to make me righteous. And it's slow. 
But it's a process that God wants to do that, that he wants me to yield to. That accelerates as I get perspective. And that accelerates as I continue to lean into the gospel and to see who Jesus is and what he has done and what he has called me to. Not by work, but by faith. Is there work involved in it? Is sanctification hard work for me? Yes, I partner with God in it. But ultimately, he provides the power. He provides the strength. And if there's ever going to be any distinction between me and the unrighteous, if I'm ever going to be righteous, then he is going to have to do the work by grace through faith. So what about those who don't place their faith in Jesus? Getting into chapter 4. What about those who don't place their faith in Jesus? What does our culture say? No big deal. All dogs go to heaven. Every religion is the same. All that, really, all that you really need is sincerity. Just be a nice person. Whatever. What does God say? He says no. He says apart from faith in Jesus Christ, you are going to hell. He says for anyone in the room who has not surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, placed their faith in Jesus Christ, you are on the highway to hell. That's what he says. Verse 1. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. So we're talking about the day of the Lord. It's, it's one of the big macro themes in the Old Testament. Prophets are continually talking about the day of the Lord, which really isn't one day. It's a series of days. It's a series of events that unfolds all over time. So it's talking about the first coming of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, the resurrection of the dead, the separation of all people into one of two eternal destinies, either heaven or hell. All right? So all that comes together. A little bit of that's fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus. Most of that is yet to come. But the day of the Lord, ultimately, this culminates in the last day, in the day of judgment. And he says the day of the Lord is going to be the best day for the believer, and it is going to be the worst day for the unbeliever. Two sides of the same coin. Okay, so why talk about hell? Why preach a sermon about hell? Isn't that kind of harsh? Who thinks it's harsh what I said a couple of minutes ago? If you haven't placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. All right, I'm getting like three. Now, we actually have more people in the room, but there isn't a lot of audience participation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get somebody to give an amen before this is over. We're going to see how this goes. It's harsh. Yeah! Get that man a coffee. It seems mean to tell people that they're going to hell, and, and in honesty, it can be mean. Okay, if, if all that you're doing is you see somebody who doesn't look like they have their life quite as well together as you do, and you shove a track in their face and say, you need to read this, because I think you're going to hell. It might not be helpful. It might not be tactful. There is an ugly way to tell people that they're going to hell. But in itself, it's not intrinsically mean to tell somebody that they're going to hell. All right, if you are on a path to hell, the most loving thing that I can do is tell you, you're on your way to hell. Especially because there is an offer and an invitation not to go to hell. That There is a solution to this problem that we call the gospel. That through faith in Jesus Christ, you can change that course. Who wouldn't want to know that? God says, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Come back to me and I will openly embrace you. That's our message. Now, some others in the room, you say, man, I'm just glad we're almost done with Malachi. Because Malachi has kind of been like this the whole time. But from what I hear, this is our last week in Malachi. And if Shannon can speed up this sermon a little bit, I think he's going to deliver and we're going to move on to something else. Maybe next week we can talk about Jesus a little bit more. Because he's mentioning Jesus a little bit, but I get this God of the Old Testament. God of the Old Testament, he seems grumpy. He seems mean. He seems, boy, he's just angry about stuff. He's talking about fire and brimstone and judgment and all of this negative stuff. When couldn't we get that happy-go-lucky Jesus guy who, who welcomes the little children? You know, let the children come to me. Don't hinder them. The kingdom of God is made of such as these. I want to talk about that nice guy. Here's what I'd say to that. God doesn't change. And Jesus is God. Jesus is a part of the is one person of the triune God. All right? Father, Son and Holy Spirit, they have the same essence. They have the same same character. They have the same theology. All right? And if you actually read the New Testament, if you read the Gospels, you find out that there is nobody in the Bible who talks about hell more than Jesus. 
Yes, he welcomes the children. Yes, he loves people. Yes, he comes to prostitutes and tax collectors and people whose lives are seriously jacked up and he invites them into a relationship with him. But he also tells them, you know what? If, if you stonewall me, if you give me the Heisman, if you don't want anything to do with me, you're going to go to hell. Because you are destined for hell, you are on your way to hell, you've rebelled against God, and I am your only opportunity to be saved. That's what Jesus says, and that is the invitation that he offers. So Jesus talked about hell because he loves men and women who are destined for hell unless they repent and believe in him. And that's why we talk about hell too. But as modern Americans, and, and even as Christians, we're slow to listen to this. Uh, this last week, I, I listened to a podcast by Mark Driscoll talking about this passage, and he just he made some good points, and he just highlighted the reality that we live in a culture where, where everyone says, you know, all religions are basically the same. The, the one thing that you need to do to get to heaven is to die. And think about it. When was the last time you were at a funeral And, and the conversation after the funeral was, I think grandpa's in hell. That's hard. Nobody wants to have that conversation. If you're thinking that, people want... <laughs> These people are laughing. I don't know. It's not terribly funny. Nobody wants to have that conversation. You know? It doesn't matter who dies. It doesn't matter what their life was like. It doesn't matter whether they believed in Jesus, whether they believed in anything. It doesn't matter whether they believed that heaven existed. Typically, what do we say when somebody dies? We say, oh, it's okay. Grandpa's in a better place. Maybe. Biblically speaking, Grandpa's in one of two places. He is either in a better place or he is in a much worse place. And the difference, the difference is not whether he died or not. It takes more than death to go to a better place. It takes the death of Jesus in your place to go to a better place. That's what it takes. So God starts with hell and then he talks about heaven. Because for the non-Christian, this life is the closest they will ever get to heaven. And for the Christian, this life is the closest they will ever get to hell. All right, we're getting a few amens this morning. This is good. We're working this out. We're like, this is training for next week. Whole new culture in the church. But, but hear that. For the non-Christian, this life is the closest they will ever get to heaven. And for the Christian, this life is the closest we will ever get to hell. Do you believe that? No way. We don't believe that. We are life lovers. Give me this life. Give me video games and food and sex and leisure and anything that, I, anything that I could have in this life. We are, even as Christians, we are desperately afraid of death. Because we do not believe that this life is the closest that we will ever get to hell. Nor do we believe for the non-Christian that this is the closest we'll ever get to heaven. We don't believe it, but biblically it is true. So God lays it out. Old Testament, New Testament, He talks about hell and He talks about heaven. Verse 2. He says, But for you who revere My name, for those who place their faith in God, for, the, for you who revere My name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. So this is a picture of heaven. It's a picture of restoration and regeneration and freedom and joy. They're released from the stall. They're leaping like calves. It's the freedom and joy and restoration and regeneration that we will have in Jesus Christ. And it's supposed to be compelling. If you're paying attention at all and you've sat through this latest Michigan winter, this ought to be compelling that the, the sun of any kind is going to rise. That the sun is coming out and there's going to be light and there is going to be heat and your seasonal affective disorder is going to begin to wane. Okay, and, and you're going to be able to turn off your sun lamp or whatever you have in your basement that you're trying to compensate for a lack of sunlight. The sun of righteousness will rise. And when the sun of righteousness rises, there's going to be some freedom. We're going to be like a calf released from the stall. We're not going to have to sit inside or, or go out in fear. Oh, bundle up, put on four layers if you want to actually step outside. A buddy of mine, he's, he lives out of state and he, uh, he just evicted somebody. He asked me to 
run over to his place and, and check out the house. The gas was already turned off, the electricity was turned off. So we walked around, we kind of inspected it, how, how damaged is this place, Luke and I, last night. And we got to the end of it, we'd been there like 20 minutes, we got in the car and Luke is asking me whether he has frostbite because his hands are so cold. You know, and I'm bigger, I'm fatter, I've, I've got more heat. I didn't even notice, you know, I, had, I didn't have gloves on. But, but he's really cold because we're in this Michigan winter. God pictures heaven as getting over the Michigan winter that the sun of righteousness is going to rise with healing in its wings. That we are going to be released, that there is going to be freedom, that we are going to be like a baby calf or a one-year-old puppy that is running around and just doing circles and crazy and having fun because we are in the presence of our God. Is that a good image? How does that compare to your hallmark image of heaven? What's the hallmark image of heaven? What have you been taught since you were six years old by a greeting card company? Clouds and halos and harps? Okay, so when I get to heaven, I'm going to be disembodied. And if I get a body back, at best, it's going to be this frumpy, lumpy, miniature, little, fat, baby thing with curly hair and, and puffy little wings that aren't strong enough to fly but are strong enough to, to be effeminate. And I'm going to have a harp. If you know me, you know that I'm not musical. Okay? I was singing this morning. Luke and I were singing this morning. Jess and Chloe, they had left early. And we were belting out some worship this morning because there was nobody here to listen or to complain about our voices. All right? We are not musical. I'm not a musical person. And if I were musical, I would not choose a harp. You know, maybe an electric guitar or something, but not a harp. So you tell 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13-year-old boys, here's what you can expect for heaven. Turn in your baseball glove and get a harp. Turn in your strong, growing, increasingly masculine body to get this goofy, pudgy, little angel wing baby thing. And you wonder why teenage boys, why anybody is running away from the church. Of course they're running away from the church. The best thing that you have to offer is me sitting on a cloud playing a harp. I don't want that. Does that sound like heaven or does that sound like hell? Hell. Crazy thing about the hallmark picture of heaven is it has nothing biblically to do with reality. That's not how it pictures heaven. When you think about heaven biblically, here's what you need to think about. You need to go back to the garden. You need to take sin out of the world. You need to take all the consequences of sin out of the world. And to do that, you don't have to take a single good thing out of the world. Get rid of sin. Get rid of the consequences of sin. Get rid of death and disease. Get rid of the fight that you're going to have with your wife on the way home from church in the car. Get rid of all of that. What are we left with? I think I, I could still have a trampoline. I, I think that, that I could be less prone to injury. I think that my body could be strong again. I don't know if I get to win the weightlifting competitions or not. I'm not sure how that competitive nature works because I'll feel bad for you if I trounce you, but maybe you have more character and humility and you won't mind getting beat. I think there's going to be baseball gloves. I think there's going to be swimming pools. I think there's going to be trampolines. I think, I think there's going to be creating and cultivating. I think there might be Legos and buildings and architecture. It starts in a garden and God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to create and cultivate. I want, I'm creative. I made you in my image. I want you to make this thing better. I want you to move from a garden to a city. I want, I want you to make this world even more amazing than the world that I gave you. It's not just going off in a cloud in heaven. It's the new heavens and the new earth. And the new earth is a restoration of what God intended the earth to be. And our new lives are a restoration of the lives that God intended us to have. The new earth is everything that God intended the earth to be before sin invaded and corrupted it. That's why the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wing to bring light into the darkness, heat into the cold, and a righteousness that drives out the corruption of sin both in the world and in me. To heal our souls, to heal the world, to bring restoration and redemption, to drive back the power of death and disease and cancer and old age. All right? So that even the grandpa, even the grandmother, even the old guy, okay, whatever, your body will be restored. You'll have health and vitality and vigor. Even the old men and the great grandmas will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. So we're talking about freedom. We're talking about joy. We're talking about restoration and hope. 
He says, set your hearts on that. Which in my book is a little bit more compelling than the hallmark, you know, harp thing. Verse 2. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. Then you will trample down the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I do these things, says the Lord. Now that's harsh. I don't know who resonates with that, who gets excited about that. If I'm being honest, that, that verse 3 it doesn't really excite me all that much. I have to think about it hard to get it to resonate with me at all. So I look at the best, rest of the Bible and I say, aren't we supposed to love our enemies? Flip over to the Sermon on the Mount. Didn't, didn't Jesus say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you? So in what sense am I going to celebrate trampling my enemies under the soles of my feet? How could that be a good thing? I don't get excited about the idea of being an instrument of God's justice because I have some perspective that I deserve God's justice. And I've received his mercy so that what I want to be is a conduit of his mercy. I want to be somebody who is bringing the gospel to others. But he says that there is a limit to the patience of God. And that there is a time that is coming when the patience of God is going to run out. And then at that point, we will no longer be on a rescue mission. For now, we are on a rescue mission trying to get everyone else who, like us, rebelled against God to come back to God. But there is going to be a time when God says, enough. You have rebelled against me enough. The opportunity to turn in repentance is over and I am going to judge your sin. What are we going to do on that day? I think the temptation that we're going to feel is that we are going to resonate with humanity. We're going to resonate with lost humanity. And, and we're, going to, we're going to say, well, I was like that, and isn't this horrible? And Kind of like what we do right now, we say save the whales. We're not terribly concerned about saving the babies or whatever. We say save the whales. I think there is a temptation in us that's going to say save the people and forget about God. But I think that when the day actually comes and we're face to face with God and we see all the people who've rebelled against God and continue to stubbornly rebel against God and continue to spit in his face, we're going to say, I want my God to be vindicated. Even more than I want humanity to be saved. That we're going to decide in our hearts, this is the team that I want to be on. And we're going to celebrate the victory of God over his enemies. That's harsh. But ultimately, what we're called to in the Bible is that we live lives for the glory of God, recognizing that justice will ultimately be done. That our king will triumph. And in the meantime, we go out in love, we go out to people who just like us have rebelled against God, and we beg them to be reconciled to God. That they might be a part of the victory lap and not on the wrong side of that, of that battle. So in the meantime, we celebrate his grace, we share the gospel with anyone who will listen. And we live in perspective of both heaven, with perspective of both heaven and hell, that drives us towards faithfulness. For us, it's faithfulness to the Great Commission. For these guys, it was faithfulness to the law. To live in obedience to the revelation that they've thus far received. That's what verse 4 is about. He says, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb, the mountain where we got the Ten Commandments and all these revelation. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. He said, the day is coming. In the meantime, I want you to be obedient. I want you to read your Bible. I want you to study the heart of God. I want you to learn who he is. I want you to understand his desires and seek to follow him. He says, don't get so caught up in everything that's going around in the world around you that you lose sight of eternity says, I made you to create and cultivate. So the fact that you love baseball, that makes sense to me. It, it's a great invention, and it is the spring. Spring is coming. Spring training is going. Let's get into it. You like food? That's great. I gave you food. Enjoy it. But don't get so caught up in food and sex and drink and pleasure that you lose perspective of eternity. And even in the midst of your deepest discouragement, don't lose sight of hope that a day of restoration will come. Verse 5. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah 
before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. So what's that all about? We're, we're in the very last two verses of the Old Testament, and he's introducing all of these new concepts. We'll just hit them very briefly. Who is Elijah? Uh, first off, okay, Elijah is one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. you got Moses. Elijah might be number two. So Moses is the one through whom the law comes. God lays out his plan for the nation of Israel, for his, for his covenant people. He says, here's the plan. Moses lays it out. And there's a lot of ups and downs in the Bible, but in general, it was all downhill from there. As God's people rebelled and rebelled and rebelled, and they repented a little bit, or maybe for a generation, and they rebelled again. But then God raised up this prophet Elijah. And it was at a moment when the nation of Israel was in its darkest days, when they have wandered as far from God as they could possibly wander. Okay, there was a king in Israel named Ahab. There was a queen named Jezebel. If you don't know the Bible, you might know the name Jezebel. You don't know what's wrong with it, but you've got this negative association that you see in culture. Maybe it's this diva thing that you think is positive. But, but Jezebel was not a good girl. Okay? Ahab and Jezebel, they are in charge. And one of the few times in the nation of Israel, the worship of Yahweh, the worship of God, the, of the living God, had been outlawed. And the worship of Baal and Asherah, it had become the official religion of the nation of Israel. And God sent Elijah, this miracle worker, who called the nation to repentance. And they repented. So that's what Elijah does. He calls the nation to repentance, and he points the nation back towards God. God says, before this, this day of the Lord comes, I'm going to send I'm going to send a prophet in the power and the spirit of Elijah, and he is going to call the nation to repentance, and he's going to point people towards me. He's going to point people towards Jesus. This is partially fulfilled in John the Baptist. If you go through, you see the different, the different references. You'll see some back and forth there, where Jesus points to John the Baptist, and he says, and guys are asking him, hey, who's this Elijah that's supposed to come? If, if you're God, if you're the Messiah, wasn't, wasn't Elijah supposed to come first? And he's like, yeah, I remember John. Well, if, if you want to believe it, th that was the Elijah that was to come, okay? But then John gets asked, are you the Elijah who was to come? And he's like, no, I'm not Elijah. Okay, so what's going on there? There's this confusion. Okay, it, it's not that Elijah's getting reincarnated. It's that a prophet is coming in the power and the spirit of Elijah. So Elijah, he was one of these few men in the Old Testament on whom the Holy Spirit came in power, indwelling him, working in him. Giving, giving him this kind of power that we, that we have access to and giving him miraculous power to do the will of God. When Elijah goes off the scene, his apprentice, Elisha, he says, oh man, if I could ask one thing of you, would you, would you grant my wish? And he's like, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think I could grant your wish. What do you want? He says, man, I want a double portion of what you got. I want the power of the Holy Spirit of God to flow through me. And it did, and he did even more amazing miracles. He says there's another Elijah who is to come, another prophet who will point people to God. That was John the Baptist. All right? But that's just the first coming. And the day of the Lord is really pointing towards the second coming. You read through the book of Revelation, and there's these prophets who are to come. Not named Elijah, but it seems to be tying in the same stuff. There's some certain things that are on Elijah's resume that are on these witnesses' resume. And they're going to be the people who call the nation back to God, point them to Jesus. All right, big picture. What's going on here? What does calling them to repentance look like? It means we're going to restore relationships with God and we're going to restore relationships with each other. If you go back through this series, we've seen the interplay between the vertical relationship with God and the horizontal relationship with people. It says, you know what? If you want to believe, if you want to be genuine in having a vertical relationship with God that is strong and robust and worshipful, you've got to work out your horizontal relationships with people. All right? So he says, I'm going to help. I'm going to send this prophet in the spirit of Elijah who is going to help you work that out. It's going to be bringing not just a return to God, but a reconciliation with neighbors and a reconciliation with families. A reconciliation between fathers and sons, fathers and daughters. I'm going to take what tends to be the fundamental breakdown in society. We see it in our society. We've seen it in others. When fathers lose their fatherly heart, when fathers are absent, I'm going to restore that thing. I'm going to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, the children to their father. I'm going to rebuild the family. I'm going to rebuild society based on a relationship with me and robust relationships with each other. I'm going to call men to have a fatherly heart towards their own children. And you know what? You see some kids who, who don't have a dad. 
I'm going to call some men to have a fatherly heart towards those kids, to engage with them and to love them and to be a father to them, even as God desires to do among us right now. And those who repent will find grace, and those who continue to rebel, they will be cursed. If, if they don't repent, he will come and he will strike them with a curse. But for those of us who are counted among God's treasured possession, for those of us who have surrendered to Jesus Christ, the curse will be broken because he became a curse for us. Because he who knew no sin, Jesus, became a sin offering for us in order that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that's what we're going to celebrate in communion. That's what we celebrate every week in the gospel. Some of you wonder, why do we do communion so often? We haven't always, but... I don't know, the last bunch of months, we've been doing it every week. Because at the heart of our Christian faith is the gospel, and this is a way that we remember it. This is a way that we celebrate the fact that, that he who knew no sin was made a sin offering for us, that his body was broken for us, that his blood was shed for us. This is something for Christians to celebrate. If you haven't yet surrendered your life to Jesus, if a lot of this is confusing, I would ask you, don't participate in this. This is a time to ask questions, to wonder, to jot down some questions that you might ask later. Okay, because we want to help point you to Jesus. But we don't want you to go through the motions of celebrating an outward symbol of an inward reality if there is no inward reality. Okay? So, Ben, you guys can come on out. We'll get ready to worship. We'll close in prayer. And then during the worship, there's stations here on each side where you can take communion and you can celebrate with us the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, we... Uh, we thank you again for the opportunity to worship. Lord, we want to pray for those who are not with us today, um, U of M students, EMU students, other families, whether they're off on mission trips or on vacations or um, just for any reason not with us. Lord, we pray that you'd be working in their lives right now for your glory, drawing them to you. Lord, I pray for those of us who are here um, that you would be humbling us around your gospel. Lord, that you'd be humbling us in relationship to each other that you would be continuing to foster the sort of unity and restoration that will make our lives truly distinct. Lord, that the righteousness that you have declared into us through faith in Jesus Christ, Lord, that that alien righteousness would flow up and that it really would transform us from the inside out, even as we worship you. Amen.